you had to learn a few things. And after you learned a few things, what happened? Like now you get on that bicycle, you don't think twice. You just get on it and pedal because you've established motor neural, neural pathways to do that. People develop those same pathways with behavior, with learning. That's the basis of it. It's all brain-based. It's all inside of our brains. And I usually have a model of a brain, which I forgot to bring, and I see they've got a sort of a half of a brain sitting up there with a um, skeletal part. But it's really useful when you understand uh, if you're interested, the neurological underpinnings of things, how this happens. There are actual pathways that happen that keep us stuck the way we are. Those pathways become habits. Habits become character. And that's how we get stuck. And kids get stuck. And adults get stuck. So think about that. Lots of ways of how people behave. This is the old-fashioned stuff. This is behavioral, which is invoked now with uh, functional behavior assessments, things we'll talk about. Humanistic, that's putting the person involved in it, uh, came, comes from the work of Ab Abraham Maslow, which has a basic hierarchy of needs. You've probably seen that somewhere. Cognitive behavioral, which is very useful in therapy. It pretty much blend some humanistic and some behavioral parts into how people you think before you do. So it's kind of useful. Social psychology, biological, what are we wired to do? How are we wired? How are we different than the next person? How are we different than our twin? My mother-in-law is an identical twin, yet she functions and behaves very differently than, uh, than her sister. Uh, and they have different biological capabilities, different environment, different temperament, they're all other blends. And then as you get older, hopefully you won't get into this. Individual personal, you know, DTD is a mental disorder that some people believe in uh, that um, really isn't. DTD is known unaffectionately to the health people. They, they just see kids and go, well, they're dumber than dirt. That's DTD. And that's a negative way of looking at someone. But sometimes these things creep in, and you may be working eventually with other teachers who don't really have a real positive view of things, so it's up to you to help them navigate that. Or MTH, meaner than hell. Sometimes there are kids that you think that they have that disorder instead of some other problem. And it doesn't really help to, to, to figure this out, it, you know, to, to blame things. It, it really is useful to think. Now, these are all different, maladaptive, and you can go into all of this stuff and we spend a lot of time discussing how all of these things can result in maladaptive behavior, which is the opposite of adaptive behavior. Adaptive behavior gets you what you're supposed to get. Maladaptive behavior can get you what you're supposed to get also, but has bad consequences. Like bullying, for example. Studies have been done with bullying that an aggressive kindergarten kid that grabs somebody else's milk and cookies and slaps a few people around, if the teacher doesn't see that, what do you think the status happens to that kid? The kid got what he wanted, he got it quicker, he's reinforced. Sometimes the other kids see that kid as, as a better model to get things with. So some of these things that happen uh, are created by um, situations. So we have to be careful what we're looking at. One of the things that we have here that we're going to focus on today is inadequate problem solving skills and some of the other concepts that help create the maladaptive approach. So even sometimes it can be maladaptive, it can get a person what they need. And typically, that's how they develop the wrong patterns of behavior, how they communicate, and are they on medication? When I was at the Renaissance Center, which was a school Dr. Bruno was talking about, there were a lot of kids that uh, had medication issues and also self-medication issues. And they'd either be uh, off their medication or trying some new experimental recreational medication and had a, loss, a, a different altered consciousness. We still had to work with their behaviors despite that. When you work with people, when you have kids in your class, whether their behavior or whatever, people in general, do you see their potential or do you see their problems? Do you see their frustration, or it just do you just see them as angry? Is working with other with other people working with you? Is that you're glad to have their involvement, like their parents, or are they just interfering? Hope or futility? All of these things go to your mental set as you work with people. It's important to keep things open. If you keep it open, I already know this, or maybe there's something useful to learn. If you try to learn something new every day, you're going to be ahead of the game. What do you see? You see both, okay? Sometimes you can get stuck with the frog. Sometimes you can get stuck with the horse. And um, usually I'll, I'll let it stay up a little longer, but we're in a rush today to get through this stuff. But you can see, depending on how you look at a situation, you may be completely at odds with the person sitting next to you. No, that's a horse. No, that's a frog. Well, it depends how you look at it. A lot of behavior has, depends how you look at it. 
when you measure behavior, this one is something that, that I sort of added to the chart based on my years at the Renaissance Center because some of the behavior was strange. Okay, so normal behavior is how often does it happen? Frequency. Intensity, how much of it does it get? How loud, how rough, how intense, how violent? And duration, how long does it last? So you can have a temper tantrum once a week that lasts all day and people are bleeding and, and near death when you're done. Or you can have many small behavioral issues that aren't so bad intensity and they only last about a minute or two. There's still behavior, there's still ways of looking at it. And then you can have stuff that just is weird, is strange. And why is that happening? Why is that kid doing that particular thing? When I was at the Renaissance Center, I did a lot of work with anger management. And had this one kid that the only way that he would calm down, it seemed, or how he started, we worked him through it, eventually was he would have to leave campus, which was against all the rules, you know, all the kids going, we called it AWOL. He'd go to the corner, street corner, and there was a stop sign. And he would hit the stop sign about five or six times, and then he was fine. He'd come back and be okay the rest of the day. So that's pretty weird, huh? That's where we get the things of atypical behavior, where things sometimes just don't fit into normal path. But you have to understand that he's getting some type of sensory feedback. He's getting the noise. He's getting a little break by walking out. And you can start breaking down the variables and why that was, why that helped him de-escalate. And then we try to figure, we figured out some other things that he could do without going across the street and still get that. And eventually, how we could begin to just talk about how frustrated he was at the time. So you just have to sometimes, you have to always start where the person is, and then you work on where they want him to be. Like there's an old expression, it's easier to ride, anybody here horseback people? Horses, okay. What do you think of this? It's easier to ride a horse in the direction it's going. If you want to go back to the barn, well, the horse wants to go back to the barn, you don't want to go back to the barn. It's a lot easier if you start to let it go that way and then you, you turn it than if you just get on it and go, no, we're not going there, we're going here. And, you know, that's when you have more conflict, more resistance. So remember that. Start where they are and then figure out where you want them to be. You have to have a plan, but you have to accept where they are. Otherwise, uh, you're going to be struggling and you build in other stuff called resistance, which all behavior has resistance to change. If you have a habit that you're comfortable with, somebody wants you to do something a different way, are you going to be like, yeah, great, I want to do that? Or are you going to be like, yeah, you know, that's good for you, but not so good for me? We have resistance because we have those neurological pathways that we're comfortable with. Here's a simple way to, to look at behavior. Too much behavior. Take a kid that's ADHD, hyperactive. They've got all this behavior. They can do something. That, you know, they, they can do it a behavior. They just can't stop it. It's too much. Too much worrying. Too much motor movement. Too much profanity. Too much talking. Too, whatever it is behavioral deficits. They can't do the behavior, so they won't do the behavior. And instead of wanting to look dumb, they'd rather look what? What's better than looking dumb, looking bad at, you know, looking mean, looking tough? I'd rather think people that I'm a rough customer than I don't know what the heck's going on. So sometimes behavioral deficits are masked because that's really the issue. And then you teach them the behavior, not public, you break them up to skill, and then you see the behavior go away a little bit. Or a failure to initiate. They can do the behavior, they just won't do the behavior. And that's often the most frustrating thing for parents and for teachers, getting them to comply with whatever it is uh, we're trying to get them to do. Failing to initiate, they can but won't. And you have to think about what's reinforcing them. What are they getting out of that? When I was at the Renaissance Center, I had this one young man who was like really big. He's a big kid. He looked older than he was, but he was big and he was also retained at least twice by the time we got him, sixth grade. He's huge. He didn't come to school. He didn't come to school. So we had attendance people. They went out to the house. They took them. They have the things in Florida. It takes I don't know what they do in Georgia, but it's like every 90 days or marking periods. And if you violate a certain number, you can eventually get to court and all that stuff. So the kid wouldn't go. I like the kid. When the kid came in, I've been to his house a few times to try to see what was going on, what was so great there. And I came to the conclusion. I told the mom, I go, How do you feel about you have a child? that retired before you did. I said, what do you mean? I go, well, he's retired. He's home. He's watching TV. He's eating microwave pizza. He's enjoying his life. He has no responsibilities. He's that's something you know that I'm looking forward to in a few more years when I retire. But your child retired before you did. He gets to have the whole thing. He just has no responsibility. So we worked on a plan to get some responsible behavior in him. And gradually, his attendance improved, although it never was, was stellar. And eventually, 
um, he made it to the next grade because we had to do a lot of backup academic work with him. How to objectively observe behavior? You got to understand the context. Where is it taking place? What is what's where is it in the classroom? Is it on the bus? Is it in the cafeteria? Who's involved with it? What are, who are the players? Who are the stakeholders? Anybody know what antecedent is? The stuff that comes before. What comes before the behavior starts? Antecedents are so important, especially when you're a classroom teachers involved with things. That's what you have control over. You have control of the antecedents, how you set things up. That becomes, what do you tolerate? Whatever you tolerate in the classroom, that's what you'll get. If you tolerate a lot of chaos, you can have a chaotic classroom. I, uh, when I was at that same center, I co-taught a class with, uh, one of the, with a guidance counselor there who was a very great guy, great photographer, great guy, I could love the guy. But his style was so different than mine, and sometimes he would go first, and we split a 90-minute period, sometimes he'd go first, sometimes I'd go first. So after a while, I decided I had to go first all the time because when he got done with these kids, they were so whipped into a frenzy that I, was, I, I couldn't do much with them. It took me 20 minutes just to get them back where they normally were because his style of teaching was way different than mine. He allowed cross-talking, he allowed whatever was going on, and you know, he still made some progress with them on, his way, but most people need a different level of structure, especially for kids that are behaviorally challenged. They don't often do real well with lack of structure. So those are some of the antecedents. We'll talk about that. The overt behavior is exactly what are they doing? What, is they, what are they doing, and why is that problematic in that situation? And that leads us to later on to a functional assessment, like what is that behavior getting for them? What need is that behavior meeting? The problem that I have with, with functional assessment behavior, is really the, it started with the low incidence handicapped, people that were mentally handicapped and had sensory deficits as well, and they felt that really there's only four goals of behavior, and it had to do with either attention seeking or it had to do with um, getting something, avoiding something, or some type of automatic response that they had no control over. And everything gets reduced to that. And in my impression, in my experience, human beings are way more complicated than that. So it's nice, it's a, it's a good piece to do, and it's required by law, and we have to do that, and it is useful in understanding strategies, but it's limiting in really understanding behavior from the full perspective. The reinforcement pattern is what happens after the kid does the behavior. For example, let's say you have a rule in your classroom, um, no calling out answers. Okay? Now let's say you're dying to say something, and you notice, what's your name? Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Nathaniel just calls out all the time, and, and I answer him all the time. I stop teaching, and I answer Nathaniel all the time, and I just keep on doing that. And what's your name? Jasmine. Jasmine's got her hand up all the time, and I don't call on Jasmine. What do you, get, what do you observe from that? What, what are the rules? Am I following them? So even though I say the rule is no calling out, and Jasmine's following the rule, doing it perfectly, she's not getting her need met to communicate, to give the class her thoughts, you're getting your need met even though it's against the rule and I'm reinforcing it. So a lot of times I could be reinforcing the very behavior that drives me crazy as a teacher. So we have to think about that stuff. What is reinforcing it? What is keeping that pattern going? What is making that kid stay home from school? What is making that kid misbehave on the bus? What is he getting out of it? What is the payoff? What's its value? And it's not what we think is valuable. It's what the kid thinks is valuable. We'll talk about that with reinforcement contingencies. This whole mess, this all has to do with the science of behavior modification. Anybody ever hear of B.F. Skinner? B.F. Skinner? Okay. He died a while back. I impersonated him once in a phone call to my friend. I said, this is B.F. Skinner. I'm in town. I want to have lunch with him. His name was uh, Angelo Di Simone, a good friend of mine. And everyone in the school was like, Dr. Skinner is on the phone. He wants to talk with you. And we had that going for a while. But anyhow, he came up with this. He worked a lot with pigeons and figured out a book that he wrote. It's very boring. If you can't sleep at night, go to the library. Or you probably don't have to. You probably just download it now. It's called Schedules of Reinforcement. And you'll see all this grass with pigeons. He taught pigeons to play ping pong. He taught pigeons to bomb things in World War II. This Skinner, okay? But he also put his daughter in a little box. You hear about that, the Skinner box? Positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, all that stuff. Human beings are very, very much, this is what causes us our greatness and our downfall. Intermittent reinforcement. 
not just people, but organisms as well. Anybody know what that means, intermittent reinforcement? What's an intermittent windshield wiper? You have that on your vehicles? Does it go on all the time? It goes on once in a while when it sort of feels like it. Usually, it's not really random on your car, but intermittent reinforcement means you don't know whether you're going to get a cookie or not. You don't know if you're going to get called on or not. You don't know if you're going to hit the jackpot or not. You don't know if you're going to catch the bass or trout or not. So you go fishing, and you never catch anything. That's called extinction. I never catch anything. I go to the lotter. I never win. I waste all my money. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm on extinction. I... Jasmine raises her hand every time in class. Ne I never call on her. Her hand-raising behavior is going to stop after a while. It's going to be on extinction. But the thing that's very interesting for humans and organisms is this concept called spontaneous recovery, which means even though Jasmine's behavior is on extinction in this particular context, maybe not in a different class, maybe in a different class, it can generalize, all of a sudden, spontaneously, one day she goes like that. The behavior comes back. A person who gives up smoking, a person who gives up gambling, one day that behavior comes back. It's human nature to have that thing called spontaneous recovery. It doesn't mean that your efforts have failed as an interventionist. It just means you have to watch out for that stuff, and you have to have a plan for it. So again, those are just some basic things. What, we, what the functional behavior assessment relies on a lot behaviorally is reinforcement of an incompatible behavior. That means if the, kids, if the kid likes to run outside the street and, and punch out the stop sign when he's upset, I've got to figure, I've got to reinforce him for doing something else that's appropriate, that I'm upset, that maybe he'll move to the back of the room, maybe he'll even just leave the classroom and wait out in the hall for somebody. That would be better than him leaving the campus, risking getting run over or cutting his hand up on the stop sign or getting Baker acted. In Florida, we have Baker Act. If you do things that are crazy enough, they can come and take you away for three days. Involuntary is probably something similar to that here in Georgia. Well, I'm not that familiar with Georgia stuff yet, but anyhow, those things are incompatible. Sitting in class, not talking, uh, facing the work is incompatible with walking around the class. If you're reinforcing in seat behavior to get your cookies, to get your reinforcement, you have to be doing the right thing. You're reinforcing an incompatible behavior with, with, with um, wandering the room, which is an antecedent for the problems. Then, in therapy, this is cognitive behavior approach. I'm not going to get too much into this, except to tell you this. Let's say you're driving down the street, you're driving down the street and the car next to you, the guy looks at you, mean, and then pulls in front of you. How do you feel? Angry. Feel angry, right? What do you want to do? Something. Honk at him. Honk at him. Do something, right? It depends on how much. What? Threaten him. Do something. Okay. So the activating event was... The guy looking at you and then almost running off, running you off the road. Your belief system, what do you think about that guy? He was what? He did that. Rude. He was rude. He did that on intentional. Why was it intentional? Because he did this first and then he did it. So he had full awareness that your car that you were driving is in his space. And he did that. So your emotional behavior, your emotional consequences, maybe anger or fear or survival or yikes, I almost, that almost could have killed me. And you're going to have, your heart's going to go, your physiological system, if you're threatened enough. What is that called in human beings when you get threatened? What do we have? Fight or flight, fight or flight. Fight or flight system. Okay. That's sometimes more reactive in certain people than other people. Uh, if I had my little brain here, I'd show you the source of that. I'll tell you about it as we go on. But that would go. And then I would be like all like, you know, revved up and wanting some kind of revenge possibly or wanting to stay the heck away from that guy. I'd have a behavioral consequence. Now, same situation guy's right next to you, and a dog, a little dog, I don't know, a little Jack Russell dog, they're kind of hyper, runs out in front of his car, and he just swerves and narrowly misses hitting you, okay? That's the activating event, the swerving of the car, but now there's a dog involved, and he's being merciful, not hitting the dog. What's your belief system now? You still run off the road. How do you feel? As angry? I'm still a little angry at first, because you probably don't realize what what happened, and then you realize, and you're like, oh, well, you know, it wasn't intentional. He didn't wasn't, mean to do that. It wasn't intentional. He didn't mean to do that. So that's your belief system. Your heart rate still might be going, ah, I almost got killed, almost ran into a ditch. But you may not feel like, you know, pulling the guy over and doing evil things. <laughs> Give it a little what for. 
give it a one floor. Okay. So that's what cognitive behavioral stuff works on. It doesn't work on the events. Events happen all the time. Stuff happens all the time. It works on how you believe the events. Because if you believe that the world's evil and out to get you all the time, you're going to be walking around on guard all the time. And if you're walking around on guard all the time, you're going to be probably creating a hostile world because you're reacting negatively to people and it becomes a cycle, it becomes a pathway that we talked about. It becomes problematic. Which brings us to this. The person who thinks that the problem can be solved is probably right. So is the person who thinks that it can't be solved because you're not going to put any effort into it. And in this case, you're going to put all your effort into it and you're going to die trying, basically. And here, you've given up before you even start it. I'll tell you about this young man. I don't know if you remember him, Dr. Brenner. This little man, <laughs> this guy came from Massachusetts it's in uh, fifth grade. He's my wife's uh, retired teacher. He's in the class. His name's Kevin. In one day, everybody in the middle school had about 1,200 kids. The first day that Kevin was there, everybody in the school knew Kevin. The principal knew him. The, everybody knew him in one day. He went up to uh, the PE coach who would bench press like uh, 900 pounds on a bad day. I'm just exaggerating, of course. Big guy. He went up and tried to choke him out the first day of PE class. Everybody got to know this young man. We didn't have RTI. We didn't have a lot of stuff then. We got his records. I got to know I was school psych at the school. I got to know him pretty well starting then. Met his family and all. And he was severely dyslexic. All he wanted to do was be in the Army. He wanted to be in the Army. He wanted to be in the Army. He couldn't read at all very well. He couldn't spell. He had good thought process. His IQ was solid. But he couldn't really do the academic stuff. And he was hyperactive. And his parents didn't believe, his mom didn't believe in medication. And that's how he was. So he ended up going to a special school, uh, if not residential, it wasn't the Renaissance Center. This was, he had an emotional behavior disorder when he got his paperwork. Then it was called SED, Severe Emotional Disturbance. And then, yeah, he went through school. He stayed in the school system. And I became very involved with him even when we changed schools. Uh, I had him running with me. I had a, a group that I taught that I didn't teach that the principal. And I did a, a grant so we could get some of the kids from the SED Center out and do community runs, like 5K runs, teach them some social skills. It was great. He was one of them. And I also had a few that I did long distance cycling with, and he was one of them. And so I knew him all the way through, and I still hear from him from time to time. So what he did was he wanted to go in the Army, and he failed, and he failed, and he failed. He's been to jail a time or two because he did things that were like paramilitary, and he wasn't supposed to be doing that stuff, threatened a few people, ended up in jail. But eventually, I got this email from him, and where he is, is this, and he says, I asked you to do something for me, it's hard to read, so I'm, it's silly, could you email Mr. Hines, he was a guidance counselor at the school called Crest, and give him a copy of the photo, and have him posted at the school, it should say, don't let anyone tell you you can't, SPC, Kevin Parrish, U.S. Army, he was in the right, he went over there, he hated it, <laughs> he hated it, which is sad because that was his whole life, wanting to go there. But he's a guy who did not give up his dream, even though a lot of people discouraged it. You can't do it. You won't make it. You won't do the ASVAB. You won't pass. You won't pass. He found a way. And he was over there. And what he got wasn't what he liked. That happens to us a lot in life. We think we want something, and we don't uh, like it as much as once we get it. But that's his story. He's got a couple of kids now. He lives in New Jersey. Mr. Hines, can you go back a little bit? Uh, Mr. Hines is the, was the... Great guy. Very lot of energy. Hyper, and, hyper too. And those of you who are doing the technology project, who are you? I mentioned to you a gentleman in Florida that you could call and get some information. That's Mr. Mm -hmm. Great guy. This is interesting. This was done on a uh, on a family counseling um, thing. A graduate guy. I'm blocking his name right now. Did this study. But this should give you a lot of hope because what it says is. When kids in school or in counseling have positive outcomes, 40% of it are based on what's inside the kid, his values, his skills, his stuff, his strengths. But 60% lies outside of the kid. So where is the rest of it? 15% is what you do. It's not that big. If you're doing something and it's not hurting and it's something that's somewhat effective, you can get 15% of power to change the behavior to help the kid. But more importantly than that, look at the relationship, 30%. If you can develop a relationship, a helpful relationship with a kid, with a student, with whoever, 
you have a lot of power. If you combine that to knowing what you're doing and injecting hope, you've got 60% of the weight that it takes to change the, the trajectory for this kid. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. And it's very uh, motivating and very optimistic. It just gives, builds a lot of hope just knowing that. That's not, kid's not stuck. You might feel stuck. You might be frustrated. Kid might be frustrated, but if you can build this stuff in, and I've had kids say to me, stop caring about me, crying, tears, screaming at me, wanting to beat on me. You're caring about me. Stop it. Because once you get an investment in the kid and you're, you have some care going on in that relationship, it doesn't fit well sometimes with what they're thinking, and it does make them give up some of the behaviors that they may not want to give up at that particular time. So it gets kind of kind of dicey sometimes. Now, be an example of that? What's that? What would be an example of that? This little kid, this little kid, was doing uh, doing better in school. He was aggressive. He was bad with the teachers. He was, but he he had a lot of talent. And uh, I believe I'm trying to think it was his math that he, but he kind of didn't want to have to be in a position where he would do it for a teacher. Even though he had the skill, he didn't want to do it because he wanted to be angry because he felt the world was threatening and not caring. And then when people cared about him, it kind of messed up his world view, and as a result of that, he reacted negatively for a while. He eventually, we talked it through, it took like six months of working on that, but we eventually got that figured out and the kid did well. But it's, it's rough, and, and what happens is people just give up. They go, the heck with you, you know, I'll go help you know, this one over here, because they appreciate it. And that's what happens with kids, too. While we're on that topic, anybody know what flat affect is? Okay, in psychology, in, um, in the personal behaviors, you have an affect, how your face looks. Okay, so if my face looks like this, whether I'm happy, scared, excited, bored, depressed, nervous, doesn't change. Flat affect. If you're a teacher or an adult and you give me a compliment, you say, this is the best lecture that I ever heard, except for Dr. Bruner's. This is the best lecture I ever heard. And I sit there like this. How likely are you to give me another compliment? Not much. But if you say that to me, and I go, oh, thank you. I'm so happy that you like it. Then you're more bound to reinforce that behavior. So there are a lot of times the kids walk around with this flat affect that really they feel all this stuff, but they don't show it in their face. They don't show it in their emotion. For whatever reason, it could be physiological, it could be learned behavior, they learn to keep their behavior, they're, they're, they have good, they'd be good to play, uh, what's that poker game, uh, uh, everybody plays, they have good, good poker face, but not so much to get reinforcement from. So you have to be careful with that, but so kids can get alienated. Did I answer your question? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you don't remember anything from today, remember this. This is what I learned that's the most useful in 37 years, whatever, I've been doing this stuff. This is the most useful, the three C's. Because if you can make this happen for a kid, or as many kids as you can, it changes their trajectory. This is a kid that, that needs help. Most kids get this. Kids that don't get it, you try to find a way to give it. Now, what is this magic elixir? You have to get them connected to something, a feeling of connectedness. Could be to you, could be to your classroom, could be to another kid, could be to the, to the pet, could a pet in the classroom, could be to whatever. You find them a way, you help them feel a connection. And this doesn't have to be a kid, by the way. When you become principals later, and Dr. Bruder did this, even though he probably didn't think about it in terms of the three C's, he made all his staff feel connected to the school. His license plate still says PGE1 on it. Pleasant Grove Elementary School 1, that was his the school of his dreams that he started. <laughs> Connected. The next thing is, the kid has to be competent in something. They have to have something that they're good at, or at least that other people feel that they're good at. It can be anything. It could be music, it could be art, it could be technology, it could be reading, it could be singing, it could be whatever they are. They have to be competent. And you find that competence. If not, you develop a competence. And then finally, they have to be in a position to contribute. They have to be able to give that competence in that area. And if you can do that, 
if you can get a kid connected, competent, and contributing, you have basically turned a kid that was alienated and turned off from school, turned off from life, and you, you, you're going to change their trajectory completely with that. Now, doing that, that's not so easy. Each kid, each case, each situation is individual. And sometimes you gotta, you got to really, really plan. There's a, we, did, we gave these plaques out that were expensive, and that was one of our English teachers. This kid was in trouble more than not, but eventually, uh, I'm trying to remember what he was, I think it was art that he did great at. I can't remember what his specific talent was, but he's feeling it there. You can see it, and he's feeling the pride in that. And a few months ago, if you put his, your arm around that kid, he'd probably be wanting to punch you in the head. Okay, and I still hear from him from time to time. Now he's got a uh, landscaping business. I just saw him at one of the, one good thing about living in a small town is you get to see these people, these kids, as adults. In fact, one of the young men that I used to work with a lot, uh, son is on the same baseball team as my grandparents, as, uh, as my grandchildren, along with the principal of the Crest School's grandchild. And they're all together, and we're all, it's just kind of strange and wonderful <coughs> at the same time. But, so connected, competent, contributing, don't forget that. And when, when you feel like you're trapped with a kid or a situation, it can be an adult too, it doesn't have to be a kid. You have a coworker and they're giving you a hard time, or a boss, it doesn't matter the level. If you get them in these three areas, you've got them, and you're gonna change your whole relationship with them. More importantly, you're gonna change their relationship with, with your work, with your life. It's, it's very, very powerful when these things happen. So remember that stuff. Why was the indifferent farmer ineffective at milking cows? Anybody know? The farmer just didn't care. Why was he bad at milking cows? Oops, we lost something. How about your head? Oops, something happened. Well, there it is. Because he had no feeling for others. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, I just like to put, that's my granddaughter, and there's the cow, just to give you a little visual. But you have to care, you have to have empathy, you have to think about other people, you just can't be cold. And some of the problems with the functional behavior analysis stuff is it takes the humanistic piece out of it. So you can't just run through a chart, and what will happen is when you get busy and somebody hands you an FBA, a functional behavior analyst data sheet, you're gonna, and you have 30 others to do, and kids, and your own life, you're going to be like, eh, I don't know, eh. Yeah. But remember, it's important, and it's important to think outside of that and to have feeling for others. <laughs> <laughs> All right, intervention process, you know, this is just a lot of stuff, which is not good for the amount of time that we have, but this is what happens. What possibly is causing it? Where is it happening? What does a kid do that has a strength? What is around that we can pull in on? Who can we use? And this is where you start using. You have a coach. Do you have a custodian? Who? There was this uh, wonderful woman who was a guidance counselor, guidance counselor secretary at the middle school where my wife taught. And we had a little girl who, uh, I don't know what happened to her mom, but she just, she was like a waif. She just didn't have anybody looking after her. And the guidance counselor secretary, um, Mrs. King, Evelyn King, still alive, her husband was band director, uh, and uh, died a while back. But anyhow, I worked with, I got Mrs. King to work with this little kid and teach her, because she had like makeup, like nasty, like, and Mrs. King was very precise with the makeup. She's always put together nicely, nice, an older lady, grandmotherly type. And she took this girl under her wing and taught her appropriate makeup and would give her little things, you know, and she'd come in, she'd have a makeup draw for her and bonded with her and developed that whole approach. So she was a resource that you wouldn't normally think about as being um, available in the school, but you got to, you know, it's, it's not about money, it's about people and what they can do to help. They'll find a way to find a makeup, they'll find ways to do that, but you as an interventionist, as a teacher, you're always looking for ways to help your kids. If there's an issue that involves anger, I know those are things that typically get most in trouble, like a kid that just calls out a little bit, not so bad. A kid that punches another kid, bad. So what triggers that? What can we use? How are we doing with it? How are we giving feedback back to that kid, back to the family? How are we knowing what works or not? That's the intervention process. And you'll get this in the PowerPoint. Then there's some specific things. This is 
just theories. One theory that I don't know if I made it up or not, but I like it a lot, and I haven't decided if anyone did this yet, but we'll talk about that one a little bit more. Cognitive restructuring, that's what we talked about before, the ABCs, when somebody cuts you off, how to think about things differently. The most powerful cognitive behavioral tool that a therapist will have, that you can have, you don't have to be a therapist, is this one, reframing. Anybody have an idea what reframing is? <coughs> reframing. Let's see. Um, reframing means to look at something from a different perspective, just like the horse and the frog and the old lady or the young lady. How do you see that from a different perspective? If you think about it literally, reframing, if this is the whole picture, and now I just want you to look at this, this becomes the whole picture. You're just looking at this. You're blocking that out. That's a reframe. If I say the person cares so much that he's, you know, he's running ahead of everybody, he's so excited about coming to school that he can't wait in line, that's different than this kid has no manners and he's just knocking anybody down. He doesn't care about anybody. You reframe it. There's ways of doing that and challenging attributions why people do what they're doing. It's important. Rational motive therapy uh, is pretty much the forerunner of cognitive restructuring and again, the stuff we just <coughs> talked about. The activating event, the belief, and how you feel about it. Because I think we're going to run out of time at some point. I'm going to throw in a couple other things that are really important. Sometimes as interventionists, as teachers, as human beings on the planet, things come along and activate our emotionality. They activate us and our heart starts beating real fast. The fight or flight symptom that happened. Anybody ever get fight or flight? <coughs> you know, I had about three or four times driving up here from uh, Florida in the rain with the traffic yesterday where people were just insane. So there's a technique that you can learn. I'll teach you real quick. It's real easy. And it will help you calm down. It's called, it has to do with an affective behavior response, and what it does is it, it shuts off a system. There's a system in your, let's see if I can get to it. Uh, I'll get to all that stuff. It's here. Oops, wrong spot. Uh, there it is. Okay. All right, here's your brain sliced. There's this little thing, there it is, over there. Actually, that's part of the brain stem. You can't see it there. This amygdala thing. This is a little tiny little gland that's on your brain stem. Your brain stem is responsible, keeps you alive, your blood pressure, your heart beating, kidneys working, all that stuff. But it doesn't have great capacity for thought. All that stuff happens up here. All oh, that's your, your main cortex, the cerebral cortex where everything happens. This corpus callosum that just attaches left and right hemispheres together nice and smooth. But this amygdala will take things and will help you determine threats or not. And what happens is when you perceive a threat, instead of going through this whole big problem-solving mode thing, you don't have time for that. Imagine if you're um, on the railroad tracks and a train's coming at you and you go, hmm, I wonder what I should do about this situation. Let's see, there's a train coming, what direction, and what's, you know, you're going to your heart would be going and you wouldn't be wanting to think, you'd want to get off the track. So what the amygdala does, it hijacks all of this higher cortex area, communicates out through hormonal systems to your adrenal glands, saying, send me some adrenaline so I can run or kill this thing and let me get out of here. So it's very useful and adaptive. But what happens is if you get too much of that, you get too much stress, you have too much stuff flying around in your body, too much adrenaline, not good for you, bad for you, stressful, bad, and you can't think well when it happens. So it's uh, useful to be able to turn this off. If a train's coming at you, you don't want to turn it off, you want to use it to get out of the way. But if it's a non-life-threatening thing, which most things are in modern society, you want to be able to do this. Really easy. You breathe in through your nose and hold it about three to five seconds. Then you breathe in on top of that breath, so it's like this. Let it out of your mouth. Now, you don't have to do it obviously. You can do it covertly, quietly. But if you do that, you will reset what's called your parasympathetic nervous system. Your heart will return to normal, and your brain will come back online. Because otherwise, your brain is hijacked for longer than you need it to be. It's very effective. I've taught principals, administrators, people to do this, police officers. It's useful, and it's very effective. You see something that's horrific, when you do that, you have, just remind, you have to remind yourself to do it really good when you get into situations that are tough, whatever they are. 
and you'll be able to turn that off. But anyhow, that's just one mechanism, one way of, of working through things. I'm going to skip over a little bit because i got way too much stuff. One quick little story. Um, I mentioned the person's name, Dr. Not knows who it is, but I remember this young man was in first grade. Feel the tension, the intensity. It was really like an anger. That, you know, I can just feel it. And then after about 15 or 20 minutes, and again, I didn't know that technique, but just by restraining him and holding him, I could feel all of that. It was like it just left him, and then he would go limp. And he was a different person after that. So my legs seemed to be all bruised up because of the kicking in there in this, uh, during this time. But that's that's an example. Of I remember, I remember. Modeling, uh, these, okay, positive reinforcement, what is positive reinforcement? So you'll hear about that. <coughs> what is that? What is tell that? Tell them that they're doing it right so they know. Okay, that's okay. a form, could be a form of it, but when it really comes down to is it's something that's going to increase the probability of that behavior happening again. So let's say, anybody here like sushi? Okay, Jen, Jen. Like sushi. Anybody here hates sushi? What's your name? Michelle. Michelle. Okay. If I say that, let's, you know, if you can answer the test that I'm going to give you, I'm not. After this process, with 50% accuracy, I'm taking you to the sushi bar and I'm buying you your favorite sashimi dinner. That's reinforcing to Janet. Michelle's like, I want, I want to do well on the test, but I don't want to go anywhere near the sushi bar. So what's reinforcing for someone, I have a chance of, of studying, you know, wanting to do better to get this, you know, to assume that there's an extrinsic reward. So it increases the probability that something's going to happen. So sometimes the problem with these behavioral technologies is the teacher thinks that something is reinforcing to the kid, the kid could care less. If the kid cares less about it, it's not going to increase the likelihood of the behavior that you want them to have. Uh, advancing. I'm just, that's a real important. Anybody know what negative reinforcement is? Negative reinforcement, people are confused with punishment all the time. Negative reinforcement is basically just you get nagged until you do it. You get nagged. How many times? I tell you, take out the garbage, 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 or a snooze alarm on your clock. If you have a snooze alarm, which theoretically is bad for your heart, by the way, I don't know if you saw some of that. It, that getting up and going back to sleep and getting up and going back to sleep is really bad. It's, you're much better off not using the snooze, either getting up the first time, setting your alarm a little bit later, so it's the one thing. It's If you're having that startle effect over and over again, cumulative is bad, but negative is turning off the alarm clock. Shut that thing up. Boom. You just want it to be gone. Now, if you're a teacher and you're nagging, the side effects of negative reinforcement are escape and avoidance behavior. You don't want any part of that. It's hard to have a good quality relationship with a person who's negatively reinforcing. It's nice people in marriages get into that pattern. They nag each other, nag each other, and they just want to go away. They just want to be separate. They don't want to deal with it. So punishment is not really done anymore, but punishment in behavioral technology has to disrupt the behavior and process. So if I'm in the middle of doing something stupid and you whop me upside the head with a brick, and I don't like that, uh, assume I don't like that, I probably won't do that anymore. That's punishment, but we don't do that. We used to hit kids with paddles. That's my first experience at the middle school. They go, come here, I need you for a minute. I go, okay, what? Watch this, I need a witness. I go, like, I, go, I didn't think you could do religion in the school, a witness for it. go, just, just stand here. And this guy whopped the tar out of this kid. I mean, just three hits, and like, my Moran hurt just watching it. So that was punishment, but it really wasn't punishment because it didn't happen, it disrupted the behavior. It happened after, out in the hall, and he had to be told, blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, that's pretty much abolished, although I think it's still on the code of conduct that if a parent really wants you to, you can walk their kid in Florida, in Citrus County. 
and modeling has to do with what happens to the other person. You know, if they did this and they did well, great. They did this and got chewed up and spit out, you go, I don't want any part of that. And we learn a lot by modeling because this stuff, we can't learn everything by positive negative reinforcement. We have to see what happens to other people. So these are all the technology of behavior mod. Inconvenience therapy is this, this is my little thing. Sometimes you just want to get something done, like electricity. What will electricity do if the wires are not are touching the wrong way? They will short circuit. What will water do? You want water to hit your roof and drain off. But if there's a hole in your roof somewhere, where's that water going? The shortest point. Kids with behavioral issues often get that trouble because they take the short. You know, I'm not going to wait in line. I'm not going to raise my hand. I'm not going to take my turn. I'm not going to say please. I'm going to grab that ball. I'm going to punch that kid. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So they basically take what you're supposed to do and find a way to do it quicker, and then they get reinforced for it. Their behavior happens. So to undo that, you have to do inconvenience therapy. So when I was at the school, I was able to do a lot of that because as soon as they came in, I met with the parents, and I asked them, I go, you know, how concerned are you about the kid's behavior? You know, would you let me work with them? And I have some ways that, that are inconvenient, but often very useful. Uh, what's that? I go, well... If the kid's having a hard time, refusing to do the work, giving me a hard time, giving somebody a hard time, instead of kicking them out of school, suspending them, how about we keep them after school long? They go, you do that? I go, yeah, I do that. Could you come and get them? They go, yeah. They go, well, if you can't, I'll drive them home. Would that be all right? We sign a little contract, blah, 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 blah. Everything's good. So now we have kids that would give somebody a hard time, and they'd call me usually when they did, and I'd have a dialogue with them, and I'd say, we could work it out now. Or after everyone goes home, we could work it out until you're satisfied with it. But if you choose to do that, I also have a lot of people I see after school, so I have like a, a free clinic going, you'll have to wait. To, if your parent can come, great. If not, if you have to wait for me, it'll be like 7.30. But that's up to you. You decide what's best, how you want it to go. And I'd walk away. And then a couple times, they would, they would challenge it, and they would stay, and it would get dark, and it was creepy. It was creepier than that thing. Creepy, there's <laughs> creaking sounds, and kind of, I don't know what, they make noises and stuff, and they often only want to do that like once. And the, the other thing that I get from that would be, you know, kids will, especially in middle and high school, will be very influenced by their peers, a lot more than adults sometimes. So I would say to a kid, I would say to the kid, you know, if we keep doing this, work, you know, after, you know, when everyone else, and I can't, you know, that's not a threat, it's not hostile, it's very nonchalant, the inconvenience, because the inconvenience, they can do it the right way now, or they can do it the right way after 7.30 and I make them write essays and I just I torture them benevolently for a long time frame. And I learn about them and they write essays about their life and their biography and we have great times and sometimes I even give them some food and water because I'm humanistic and I don't want them starving. They're not hungry. I get after school so we'll share some snacks. Anyhow, um, the idea is to make the behavior that's expected more convenient than the behavior that they get in trouble for that they previously got reinforced for. So that's the whole, it's like a late fee on your credit card or a late fee at the bank. You know, if you do it the right time, you don't pay the penalty. If you do it the wrong time, it's not emotional, you missed the date, it's objective. But I try to inject, you try to have to inject a more humanistic approach like you really don't mind either way, it's okay for you. And I would say it's nice having company around here because I get creeped out here at night. And that sun goes down, it gets. Freaky out here. So you're shifting it all, it, it becomes the responsibility of the kid versus the interventions. You just have to set it off in advance. And then the peer stuff I was telling you about it, when I would talk to the kid goes, You can't make me stay after school because they'd after all I'd realize that I'm really talking about keeping them after everybody leaves, and the other kids goes, You will, and you will. You'll be there. We're taking kids off the school bus. We stopped the school buses from going home, inconvenience some of the other kids, had the deputy remove the kid, bring them in. They sat down and I mean Sometimes that's what it took, and we just kept working it. There's a, there's a, a saying that's useful when you're an interventionist. If not you, who? Think about that. If not you, if you're not going to do something about it, who will? So if you're in the role, you get into a position to do that, think about it. Sometimes you're the last chance you have to change a kid's trajectory. Relaxation, this stuff is uh, stuff to get people calmer how they can talk themselves, calm the visualization, the deep breathing, there's all that stuff. This is stuff, aerobic exercise is great, there's more research now, kids need to get out, they're, they're very bound into academics, they need to be moving, they need to be doing things, so do adults, 
be to distress themselves. This is a way to reframe a problem. If I can get all this stuff out of here real quick. A problem, instead of, oh, it's a problem, you have to look at it differently. The reframe is a problem is the difference between what you expect and what you got. This is what I expected. This is what I got. That's the magnitude of the problem. How do you change that? Well, did I define what I wanted? Did I explain what I wanted? Was it realistic? Was it clear? Did I consistently enforce it? If I'm a classroom teacher and all heck was breaking loose in my classroom, there was a study done a while back to take regular kids, normal kids, and turn them into ODD kids, oppositional defiant disordered kids that wouldn't listen. And that was because they used very poorly defined expectations, you know, inconsistently reinforced it, and in like a couple hours, uh, they were able to make kids look like kids with ODD. They got them back, of course, after that. But you can create this situation. That was a situation that happened when I took the class over from the gentleman uh, that I, I split the class with. We had different expectations. Then you start to look at what is the behavior that you're looking at. Is it something they can't do, won't do, or they don't think it's at all relevant and they can do it and they just think, then you have to there figure out how to make it seem relevant to them. So your goal is to diminish that difference. Now, this is a good model that you can use in life and you can teach people with. You probably have seen this somewhere else. When all else fails, go back to this model. FBA, every medical stuff, everything is based on this. What is the problem? And you have to define it clearly, not this is a lousy kid, this is a lousy sub, you know, nothing has to be clear, has to, I hate school, you hate the bus, no, you hate the cafeteria, no, you hate all the kids, no, you hate all the teachers, no, what's bad about school, I hate math, oh, so that's the problem, okay, you brainstorm all possible solutions, well, what can we do about it, well, I'll never do math again, I'll, I'll be in the clinic all the time, whatever it is, those are negatives, as well as some positives, I can get some tutoring, get some extra help, I can stay after school, I can whatever. Look at the positives and negatives of all of those solutions, select and implement the one that gives you the best bang with the least negatives, and then check on it to see how it worked. A very basic model in counseling, in education, in medicine, it's important to have this model and to teach kids these models, because if you teach kids these models, they don't kill themselves. If you teach kids these models, it's also a, a drug-resistant approach, too. And it's also, they have more options. They don't get stuck. So if you can teach somebody this model and have them practice this, it's amazing, okay? When I was uh, in school, when I was at the Renaissance Center, I used an example of buying a car as a problem. Like, I wanted this car. The car of my dreams at that time was a Porsche Cayman. Anybody know what a Cayman is? It's like a cross between a 911 and a Boxster. Anyhow. I talked about how much it was, I talked about, I used this as a model, I used it as a model, and I went on, like for years I used that. And then one day, guess what I drove to school? A Porsche came in. And before I even came in, the kids were like, they were happier than I was. <laughs> they were like, you did it, you did it, you've been talking, you, they were so excited, because it was actual application of this that uh, most of them got to see. And that was the validator it was, and there's the model, and I explained how I paid for it, and what the benefits, and how to do all that stuff. And they got to see it. So that's a, just a lifetime example of that. And then I also told them, if you graduate high school and have a driver's license, you come back and see me if I'm still working, or even if I'm not, you find me, and you can drive whatever vehicle I have at the time. And a couple of kids have taken me up on that. In fact, the kid that's on the baseball team with uh, uh, the parent uh, who my grandkids have that getting close to, okay. Uh, we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago, plan, do, study, act process, which parallels that, except that's a little bit more specific. It's basically, yeah, and how you plan, how you do that. And the first part is, if you went to the doctor and said, I don't feel good, what kind of diagnosis are you going to get? Good one? What, what kind of question is she or he going to ask you? What hurts? What's wrong? What seems to be the trouble? Tell me more. Blah, blah, blah. And until I go, well, you know, I get a stabbing pain in my left eye when I drink iced tea. Ever happened to any of you? Now the joke is I forget to take the spoon out. But until I get real specific <laughs> about the problem, it's just muddy. If you bring your car to the mechanic and say it's not running right, what kind of bill are you going to get? 
like ginormous, right? If you go, uh, the power steering seems to make noise when I wheels lock to the left, you're still going to get a big bill, but it's going to be limited probably to the power steering pump and the hydraulics that go with that. So you have to be careful. Okay, we're running out of time. Affect communication skills. This is stuff that you can learn. Some of you do this automatically, active listening. It's such an easy skill, so often not used. It's tagging the emotion back to the response of the person. If I said to you, I'm so excited to be here today, what's wrong with that? You don't sound good. I don't sound good, so I'm not matching it. Plus, what's my, what's my overall experience? Now, I could be a flat affect guy, and I am real excited, or I could just be incongruent, or, but the main thing is, what do I say, you know, how I'm saying, I'm so angry that that person cut me off. Well, you're really upset about your drive up here. Glad you're here safe. Active listening links the emotion with the event. Very useful in working with kids. It opens the door and allows them to talk more. I messages, very clear. This is in marriage therapy. We teach teachers to do this all the time. When you, I feel because. When you, I feel because. When you make meatballs for dinner, I feel very happy because that's my favorite thing that you cook. I don't know where that came from. I guess I'm getting hungry. But when you, I feel because. When you raise your hand in class, I feel very happy because you've learned some good self-control and you always have good things to contribute. My message. When you don't raise your hand in class, I get concerned because it hurts my ability to teach the class well. This stuff is more complicated. You probably won't see this anywhere. Modality awareness. Sometimes people speak in modalities. The other day, I saw this. I heard this. I felt this. Sometimes people get stuck in the modalities. You can have a person, if you listen to them long enough, they will tell you that they're either seeing things or they're hearing things or they're feeling and touching things. I struggle. I got stuck. I couldn't move. That's a person who's tactile, who's haptic. If you talk to them back in haptic terms, you're going to communicate with them. It's a little sneaky. It's a little, it's a little technique-y, but it's very effective. Paraphrable is how, how we say what we say. How we say what we say. And this is all part of this whole process, which we're not going to have time for today. This is what people do when they get upset. There's a whole curriculum, which maybe you'll see at some point, called a, a nonviolent crisis intervention. But what's really useful is this, how to set limits. First thing is, if you're not calm when you set the limit, you're going to overreact, it's going to come out badly. So you do that relaxation response, you stay calm. You find a win-win situation. Please turn off that phone so you can keep it for the rest of the day in your pocket. Versus, if you don't turn that phone off, I'm taking it from you. What would you rather hear? You know, Win-win. Reasonable, respectful, enforceable. You've got to make sure that what you're saying you're going to do, you can do. When I tell a kid he's staying after school, I made sure in advance that I could do that. Otherwise, it erodes my capabilities. Firm and kind, that's another key thing. You got the three C's, remember them? Connected, competent, contributing, and firm and kind. If you're firm and kind in how you deal with people, you're gonna come along okay in most things in life. You're not gonna have anything gonna win 100%, but it's gonna change it. Allow time for the person to accept the parameters that you're giving them. Don't want to rush them. Think it over. I'll come back. Let me know what you decide. If you give it to them, even little kids, let me know what your choice is. My daughter is a second grade teacher, and uh, she's like magic with kids. So her principal, who's a pretty demanding principal, maybe the most demanding in the county right now at elementary, a little gal walks around on high heels, and you can hear her like clicking, and, and the teacher's hearts go. They have this emotional reaction every time they hear her walking down the hallway. But for whatever reason, Marley and, and they get along great. And I just offered her to see if she could be a guidance counselor, even though she has no guidance experience, because she's firm and kind, and she just does all this stuff. She just does this stuff. She's like magic with the kids. Express gratitude prematurely. If you thank somebody for behavior that they didn't do yet, what do you tell, what, what's your expectation? That they're going to do it, right? No, but please sit down. Thank you so much. I've already increased the probability that you're going to sit down because I nicely thanked you for it. Thank you. Yeah. So 
if you express gratitude prematurely and you're clear of what the behavior is, it's just a little trick, how to set some limits, how to reframe, refocus perspective. I know that's what you wanted. This is what we have to do right now, and we'll get to that if you just give me a few moments. Set the limits. If you can't do this, you're going to have a mess. With kids, your own kids, with relationships, this is important. And how we say what we say, how loud we are, the tone, cadence. What do you think the worst tone to have is? Angry one. Mm -hmm. And what else goes with that? Sarcastic. Sarcastic tone. <laughs> that just makes most people's skin crawl and just, they don't want to, you know. And sarcasm is angry. It's disguised, it's, it's anger disguised as uh, humor. That's what sarcasm is. So watch that tone. You don't want to be condescending. And how fast you talk. Or slow. That's the other thing. My daughter would be like, she'd be like talking like a mile a minute. She, goes, she would work with some high school kids at this other job she had. She goes, I don't understand why they don't do anything. I tell them, listen. I go, Marley, I'm listening hard and I can't understand five things you just said. So you gotta slow it down. And that was hard for her. So she eventually slowed it down and got better. Uh, Give her to skip through this stuff. This is all part of the CPI process. And read that. This is really useful. This is after something negative happens. You want to talk about it. A lot of times people want to get away from it. But what you want to be able to do is find out from a different perspective what happened. Control means you're calm, the person's calm, you can talk it over. You can, oops, can I lose your, oh. oops. You can figure out what their perspective was. That's orient. You can figure out what patterns may have led up to it. You're going to get copies of most of the stuff. Investigate what you could do wrong. And then the last part is to, give back, uh, to negotiate which one you're going to actually do. Because sometimes you can come up with a great idea as an interventionist. The parent doesn't like it. principal doesn't like it. Nobody likes it. It's no good. You don't want to make like you're going to do something when you can't. You have to come up with an idea and then find out from the rest of the stakeholders in the process if that's going to fly with them. Is fine, and then eventually you give them back some respect and dignity. It gives closure. If we don't have closure to emotional transactions, it kind of leaves us hanging. Think about a person in your life that you had a bad reaction with, and you never were able to have some kind of closure on it. It's unfinished. It stays with you, versus you know you've had some closure. We need that as human beings. We're always looking for closure. That gives it to us. That this one we have time for is real important because this is what happens to a lot of good teachers. The kid has a behavioral event. They do something problematic in school. The student goes home and tells the parent how bad the teacher was. You should see what Doctor he did. He was horrible. He said this. He said that. The parent then has some kind of emotional response, which usually isn't. He serves you right. It's usually like that guy. Which I straighten him out. I'm going to call everybody. I'm going to get his license. We'll see what happens to him. The parent comes in and expresses that, then what do we do? We get defensive, punishing, or who cares, your problem. I was just trying to help. Then the parent and the student have their perceptions really, yeah, he is an idiot. And the kid walks away like that, a little halo on the kid who started this whole process. But we bought into it and we didn't change it. So this we can change a lot of behavior here. We had so many parents come in so angry and would usually leave crying and appreciative. And sometimes that would take hours the first time. Second time, it's still coming angry, less time. Third time, better. So we would eventually have to, if you get the parents on board with what you're doing and you teach them some skills that work, you've got something there. The cycle of woe. This is what happens. This is from the kid's perspective. They get redirected, they don't listen, or they're disrespectful. The teacher responds to that, the kid responds to that, and you go around and around and around, and nothing good happens. Our, our as interventions, we have to break that. We have to teach the teacher how to respond, and we have to teach the kids what to do to break the cycle. And I use that with kids all the time. This is. Didn't have time for this. Thing. Another time, maybe. 
this. This is Maslow. If your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Useful to think about. What else can I do in this situation? You don't want to just bang everything out. If you start to get like this, or your own people start to get like this, you need to take a mental health day or a break if you're getting all the stuff is happening and you're looking at things where you get rigid and unfair, this is burnout, and you know, you're starting tabula rasa right now, but you're going to be around folks that have had this. Don't let it spread to you. This is just saying, uh, I just want to get to, if you can show people that you care and find humor in situations, if you can find, especially with the older kids, you can find some humor in it, especially they're inappropriate. Uh, you know, in my school, it was nothing for them to say derogatory words, profanity all the time. I'd have them, you know, say, you know, you know, principal or something, and they would say, they would say, well, F the principal. You know, and that's not a good thing to say. And I would say, you know, is that what you really want? And then they would just start laughing, and it would just diffuse the situation. Sometimes you have to find humor, and then they would just, the whole behavior would, cycle would change. And it would, it would, you know, change. So sometimes there are ways of, and I showed, you know, I didn't, where they were, they were angry at that point. I could active listening, but I just said, is that really what you want? And they, he just realized that and changed. Never given up hope, helping getting other people to try to connect with them, coaches outside the school, given that concept that you believe in people. And then sometimes you have to slide in the back doorway, finding some other ways to get them. I don't have time for all this stuff. I apologize for that. There's a lot of stuff. If you model respect, you can do a lot. A lot of times, especially in the older, and you know, maybe you'll start, anybody like want middle or high school, or what schools, you know, middle and high school, with them especially, they will look for you, they will look for hypocrisy in your behavior. So if you're going to be, you're going to be model self-control, listening, and you make a mistake, you know, I made a mistake the other day when I assumed this, when I assumed that. I was wrong, I apologize. You would not believe the power that that has, because they're not used to having adults in an authority position admit that they can make a mistake. So you model it, you're human, you model self-control, and it just, respect just blossoms, and it's not just a technique to do, it's just true. And kids would watch, new kids would come in, they'd watch to see how I would handle the situation with the kid. And if it looked like I was being respectful, then the next time I had to see the other kid, he already had me as someone that wasn't just a, a nasty authority figure. Try to get them help, help them get them involved in, in the functional behavior assessment part. You'll be asking them, well, what would you like out of this? What could help you? What would you need to be able to stop hitting that stop sign or stop punching that girl or stop cussing the teacher? What can we do? And again, Again, this is to leave you with this. It's not whether they're competent, it's whether we're competent enough to get them there. That's the challenge. And if we reframe it like it's not them, it's us, and what can we do to be better at what we are, then the probability of having good outcomes increases geometrically. And with that, I'll let your weary brains rest and <laughs> think about behavior. I appreciate your good attention. Any questions before I know Dr. Bruner had some tests to give out? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, I've got something to give to Dr. Kanak. I'm going to, uh, your test score is on Moodle, but I want to have some time to talk to you about uh, how I did the essay, <clears throat> and it just doesn't feel right to do that right now. So you can see your total score on Moodle, and then Wednesday, I'll, I'll hand back that test, and then we can talk about the essay part. The essay was 15 points, the test was uh, 50, but I want to talk to you about how I calculate that. Please bring your computer on Wednesday, and um, we're going to, Wednesday's going to be kind of a day, we're going to talk about live text, I've got uh, something left over from this last chapter, and then um, kind of get you ready for the next uh, chapter. I've got one thing I need to get in my office for, for Dr. Knott, and uh, it'll take me a minute or two to do that. Would some of you mind just sharing with Dr. Knott something that sort of caught your attention or something that you uh, thought about or are thinking right now? Uh, just as a way to kind of honor uh, you. Yes. Um, I like the way you said that it's not about like what, whenever the child is like really excited and really ready to do something, 
that, you know, they're not, like, running through. It's not that they don't have any manners, which is what people assume. Mm -hmm. It's, like, you have to think of things from two different ways. Like, you can't just assume that because the child is running around that he has no manners or he just is not, you know, just is wild, but it could be that he's excited. Yep. But he's happy, you just have to... Finding another explanation mm -hmm. for the behavior that is maybe driving Closer up the wall at the time that, okay, well... You don't want to kill out enthusiasm. You just want to curb it a little like the mm -hmm. HBO special. <laughs> very good. That's very important. And remember the, the three C's because, to me, that's the most powerful thing you can remember. But the hard part is the art behind that. And psychology and all this behavior intervention, there's science to it, but it's still more art than science. Psychiatry is certainly more art than science. Psychology is the same. So if you can find out how to connect them, what they're good at, and how you can get them to be this. We had this one kid that had a flat affect, miserable all the time, hardly would come to school. He was a technological genius, though. We found that out. We didn't know about him. Somebody mentioned it. And we were having trouble with uh, our video system. We wanted to do a school, um, uh, what do you call it, a school channel, school show? What was that called? School news crew. School, a school thing on news team. news team thing. And we had no clue. It was a brand new school, and somebody walked away with the manuals. We had no idea how to hook this stuff up. We had like a, probably about $5,000 worth of stuff sitting there with no clue. And we tried it. We couldn't do it. We got this kid. We let him alone for a half hour. Zing, 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 zing. zing. You go, here you go. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So we made him a badge. He was our technology expert. He had flat affect. He was autistic somewhat. He was on a spectrum. Whenever somebody came in with any technology, we got him out of class. He was the most competent. He was. We didn't have to fake he had the competency, we just let him contribute it. This kid, was uh, he was smiling, and he never smiled before because that matched. That's just one of the, the terrific times that, that's such a good example of when that goes right. The problem was, after he did so well, he left our school, and they, the kid never got that chance in the larger school, which we couldn't control, and he ended up coming back and recycling. That's what happens in alternative schools sometimes. They get successful, their needs are met, they feel connected, competent, and contributing, and then they go to a big school and there's like, now they're just one of, you know, 2,000 kids and there's not enough resources there when you're like one kid with, you know, with, uh, 80 kids with a bunch of teachers and people that care. So, cool. Well, you, got the, uh, you got the water hose, you got the fire hose version, uh, because you've yeah. got psychology, <laughs> you've got psychiatry, and um, this class is not designed for you to understand or to, or to demonstrate all of those concepts. But if you could pick, whether it's a sweet seas, if you could pick a couple techniques or, or the, the idea of thinking of strategies, the idea that you got to be creative, um, if you can pull a couple things away from this uh, uh, presentation, uh, it'll be very helpful to you as you go along. So, so on behalf of the class, here's just a little something for you. Um, it's a Sir? Yeah. yeah. Young Harris College. Very good. <laughs> I will you honor this. Bag too. I will honor this. I got the bag too. There you go. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Coming all the way up from Florida. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you came up. I'm going right home now. Just yeah, <laughs> okay. I'm up here for the week. Got a place uh, up the road. Yeah, beautiful yeah, town that you have. This is so, so lucky to be able to, to be up here. Florida now is like pollen, you walk outside, your car is covered in yellow stuff this thick, caterpillars are dropping off the trees and little worms, which I got all chewed up from, uh, not the worm, caterpillar, they're toxic, so glad to be here for a week, hopefully when I get back, they'll be gone. Thank you, Dr. Not. Thank you, we'll Dr. Brew. We'll see you on Wednesday, and we'll do some wrap-ups. Good luck with your future. Yeah, our, yeah, that's so cool how that minutes. turns. It's, it's